Hey, Stalker. Tired from a long journey, I assume? Why not sit here and rest by the campfire? Kick back for a bit, have something to eat, and share some stories with the guys. You've undoubtedly seen a lot in your wandering. I mentioned this over in the video game Urban Legends threads, and I think it's time to make an entire thread on this. Carnaval was an arcade light gun shooter that came out on October 31st, 1998 and was both published and developed by Midway Games. It was a bestseller and even outsold Mortal Kombat for that year. Yet despite its popularity, it never had a sequel nor has it been released on a home console or PC. The game is noted for its extreme graphic violence and surrealist dark comedy. But there's a much darker secret and I've been trying to figure it out. If you're expecting some low-effort creepy pasta, then look elsewhere. This is real and I know what I'm talking about. Carnaval was a game developed mainly by a right-wing Celtic pagan folk cult, and was meant to be part of a series in a complex set of rituals for Sam Ein. The Celtic New Year that has been commonly misidentified with Halloween by clueless redneck. Protestants? The game itself was the concept of Jackie Hager, a Midway employee at the time who had no real connections to the cult and wanted to just make a spooky Halloween horror game, for my former brethren working for Midway at the time. He's what's known as a useful pawn. This Games Radar article published for the game's 20th anniversary in 2018 is mostly just fluff, but there's useful tidbits of information in it. Namely, it confirms the existence of the lost console port and its bizarre development that he was largely kept out of and that Midway's higher-ups were giving them some trouble. The real mystery is the tunnel. A level that was cut completely and the only thing remaining in the game's code is the song for the area of the game that was found by emulators looking into the code for cut content. The music sounds like the smooth jazz elevator music you'd hear in softcore cable porn like on late night Cinemax back in the day. It's obviously meant to be a tunnel of love. To keep in tune with the game's carnival fairground theme and because it's meant as a virtual sex. Ritual blending sex and violence, as was a part of Celtic pagan rites in the ancient times. Midway's higher-ups made sure the tunnel was cut because it was too offensive, and they did not want arcade owners to ban the game if you played Carnaval. Then you would know the tunnel of love would be really fucked up to be too offensive for the most. Twisted arcade game ever made, there's a bunch of other weird shit in the game's code including placeholder images of Sailor Jupiter and a shopped image of Jeffrey Dahmer holding a severed head of the Midway executive that gave the devs issues, meant as a joke. The devs who were part of the cult were also weebs. The old-school 90s weebs who were known as otaku and liked violent edgy shit and guro hentai. Well, the game's credits even mention Princess Serenity in the credits under special thanks and this. Cult I was and did have members in multiple states and even a small group in Ontario. The leader in the Canadian branch was a stereotypical otaku who was obsessed with Sailor Mercury and was on a Dateline report. But a lot of his more overt, neat otaku behavior was meant as an act to fool people into thinking he was an incompetent basement dweller instead of the Canadian equivalent of Lord Summerall. He was not the leader at the time the interview took place in the 90s, though. And I'm not sure if he had any connections to Carnavio, or more specifically, the lost console version that was an entirely different kind of game instead of a mere arcade port. It was the media in Japan that labeled Hitoshi and others like him the otaku. Translation, shut-in, fanatic, geek. People so utterly obsessed with information that they become withdrawn from society. It seems that information technologies have bred the ultimate fan. And now they're starting to emerge here. Hi, Greg. Hi, Hi. Todd. Great. Come on in. Great, thanks a lot. So you're the ultimate fan. I don't know if I really want to flatter myself that way, but uh, I, am, I am definitely obsessed with, uh, with uh, Ami Mizuno, Sailor Mercury. <laughs> You guessed it, Greg Taylor is also a big fan of anime. More specifically, this 20-year-old university student's love is... 
She's the lead character's sidekick in the popular children's cartoon called Sailor Moon. He's created an online shrine for the inked superhero, and he's constantly searching for new information to add to it. She wears glasses. In the, in the fourth season, she gets, she gets glasses. And uh, also in the fourth season, when she powers up into uh, Super Sailor Mercury, she gets three earrings instead of just the one. So what are we going to see at this animation festival today? Just uh, animation. So what's that? Oh, it's sort of my good luck talisman, I guess. My Mercury plushie I carry with me everywhere. The tunnel itself was alleged to have contained shocking footage and coded messages that the cultists would get but would be meaningless to anyone else. Some of the footage and imagery included an array of images related to Celtic paganism and Guru, anim artwork, as well as clips from the following titles with the following directors and release dates. The Wicker Man, Robin Hardy, 1973, Born to Raise Hell, Roger Earl, 1975. Cannibal Holocaust, Ruggiero Diodato, 1980, Legend of Lion Flare, Yorihiso Kida, 1986, Yorotsuka Doji, Legend of the Overfiend, Hideki Takayama, 1989, other footage I was informed of were the Bud Dwyer tape in GIF format, and some taped rituals possibly involving nudity, sex, and animal or human sacrifice. The tunnel and the console port were both going to have various clips from these assorted sources, but were cut for being illegal and difficult. But Dwyer's death is legally available and not under copyright, so all that's left is either the taped ritual being illegal or, more likely, the movie and anim footage being a case of copyright infringement and being unlicensed. More proof of the cut images that did survive into the game, like the Sailor Jupiter placeholder pick, which is entirely different from the other placeholders. And the Shooped Dahmer image, Joe Pilato was offered to do voice work for the console version, but was disgusted at the script and refused. He played Rhodes in Day of the Dead and did some anim and cartoon voice work in the 90s. Most notably Digimon, pick-related, creepy shit, man. Where did you get this information regarding the clips? close friend of mine worked at Midway on the dev team back then. We actually were both roommates in Iowa at the time and he had the places of residence, an apartment near Chicago he rented in his name, and the ranch in Iowa that the group owned that I lived on. Midway Games had their main HQ in Chicago, and they had several smaller offices in Illinois and Iowa for their arcade division. I know that sounds like one of those my dad works at Nintendo excuses, but it is true. I've met a lot of strange and varied people in the old pagan community. As you drift further away from the Wicca and New Age garbage, a lot of people overlap or keep in touch with one another more closely like I said. I actually was part of a Celtic pagan folk cult mainly devoted to worship of La Ecni and the Dagda, as well as the Morrigan a lot of creepy and disturbing rituals are associated with the Morrigan. She is nothing like the Wiccan goth girls and New Agers portray her as. If you read Celtic myth, you'd know that. So the cult is a bunch of weeb DND nerds that fetishize Celtic pagan ethnonationalism. Yeah? Sounds typical for 90s game devs. Can't count the amount of weird dudes on Doom forums exactly like this. The weebs and D&D &D nerds were simply two of the demographics the cult recruited from. They also did recruitment in the goth and metal circles as well, preying on outcasts and people from broken homes and dysfunctional families the longer you were in. The cult. The more that was discouraged and if you wanted to advance ranks. You had to get deeper into the occult pagan and right-wing stuff. I left the cult in 2002. A few months after 9-11s, shit was getting serious and I bugged out of there. No longer live in Iowa and I don't keep in touch with anyone from the cult. The game devs who were working on the console version of Carnaval were a third-party group, contracted by Midway as opposed to the actual employee devs who did the arcade version. Only two of those guys were cultists, my old roommate and another person. They were in the lower ranks, and I actually met Greg the Canadian weeb who loved Sailor Mercury around 1999 or 2000, when the Ontario branch met up with the other Midwestern sets of the cult. 
He had lost weight and became less interested in Anum and more fixated on worship and rituals, so he could gain rank and not sure if the cult is still active or if they have rebranded after Columbine and 9-11s. The cult intentionally kept an even lower profile, and there was a lot of fears of law enforcement getting involved, since a lot of guys stockpiled weapons and some of them sold drugs too, and a lot of cultists did all sorts of criminal activities. Some of the advanced rituals would also be considered felonies, and a lot of people started panicking and jumping ship in the early 2000s, some of the oldest, Members of the cult originally belonged to white gangs in the wider Chicago area like the Jousters, Gaylords, Stone Freaks, and Uptown Rebels pick related I know I did. What would they do in these rituals? Did they worship Celtic gods? They worshipped Celtic gods and goddesses rituals often involved sex acts both gay and straight, lighting candles, bloodletting and self-harm, and plant sacrifices. More advanced rituals for certain holidays or special events involved sacrificing live animals, namely farm animals like chickens, pigs, sheep, and at one point, a calf. There were rumors that some of the other sets in Michigan and Kentucky who went and did human. Sacrifices of kidnapped people such as potential informants or rival gang, cult members. But I honestly doubt those claims animal sacrifices were real and I saw them firsthand. Took part in some of the self-harm and candle lighting rituals. Initiation rituals were similar to gang initiations and included beatings followed by group sex. Often of a sadomasochistic bent still have nightmares from my initiation into the group. Having a bunch of people beat the shit out of you and then literally fuck you in the ass back too. Back is not fun to say the least, but I wanted to prove myself as worthy of the cult. I welcomed it at the time and signed off on those acts more or less. But I regret it deeply now I did have a car and I was a quartermaster and steward. My job was to acquire weapons, food, fuel, ammunition, and other basic supplies for our stockpile in Iowa, this CD, a wallet, a knife, and some clothes were what I was able to take with me when I got in my car and drove away from them. Cult forever that snowy winter morning in 2002. There were other aspects to the cult as well, and we tried to infiltrate the video game industry and recruited from certain nerd fandoms and IT workers, you know how back in the 80s, 90s, and early OOs you had Christian conservatives who went on about how video games, D&D, &D, rock music, and any form of fantasy or horror fiction was inherently satanic and meant to program people. We believed that the Christians were full of shit about games and movies being used as satanic recruitment tools, but we believed that they could be used as propaganda for the purposes of thought control and to condition people to be violent when mixed with certain stimuli and specific mental and physical conditioning regimens like We'd watch all sorts of extremely violent and dark movies, TV shows, and Anum and read all sorts of books of a similar bent in our spare time that weren't tied to. Work or worship, the stuff we watched was always either rated R, NC-17, or X. And we also watched hardcore S and M porn and all sorts of Guru and demon hentai. It was supposed to desensitize us and reconfigure our minds to make us warriors for the gods. Sort of like the Fianna of the Fenian Cycles or the Warrior Hero Kuchu line. We also did lots of LARPs and campaigns for D&D &D and Vampire. The Masquerade as a form of psychological training. My biggest concern is if whether or not the cult as a whole is still in existence and whether or not any of these people did successfully infiltrate the gaming industry after the failed Carne Veal. Attempt even if the cult itself was disbanded. I could see some individuals retaining their fucked up beliefs and trying to continue the experiments on their own with a new cult or something. The two guys at Midway on the Carnaval dev team were based out of Iowa and commuted to Illinois. But the small studio that was contracted to do the console version of Carnaval more of a remake, sequel than a true port were from the set based in Michigan, only met to people from the Michigan crew at a Lamas gathering in the late 90s. A guy and a girl. 
Both of whom were creepy even by cult standards the girl had a weird obsession with JFK. Kind of like that goth girl who claimed she was married to Sapphiroff or something, personally. I think she was batshit crazy even back then like. We're talking they could have been characters in an August underground movie or something. I wouldn't be surprised if the cult was organized as some black ops recruitment farm by some bigger organization. I'm not sure if they were being used by Deep State or some other larger cult unrelated to any of it. But I always thought it was unusual for such a fringe cult to have so many sets in multiple states, and even one in Canada, but they were all small in number. The Iowa set I was in ran at about 20 or so deep at most. The Kentucky set was about 10 or 12 people at its peak. And there were groups in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Virginia whose sets were in the single digits. The biggest group was the mother chapter in the Chicago area at around 50 people or so. And the Michigan guys were anywhere from 15 to 25 people. Maybe some of the more promising cultists were let into a bigger organization or something. We watched a lot of zombie movies and used the zombie apocalypse as code for training for a SHTF scenario. This was in the 90s and very early 2000s, before The Walking Dead or even 28 Days Later, when zombies went full mainstream. All of a sudden the CDC and FEMA were using zombie apocalypse imagery to raise awareness for it. Emergency preparedness and disaster prep could have been a test run for predictive programming. Or maybe it was just a coincidence, IDK. If the cult owns music, TV, and news, it probably owns video games. Especially when you consider they are mostly murder simulators. Also, how poorly they treat their employees is a telltale sign. True. But this cult didn't own any of those things per se. They did try to infiltrate these studios and companies, though. I didn't work for Midway, but my roommate did, and he didn't really say too much about being treated poorly. He mainly complained about his meager paycheck, which may have been small on its own, but was definitely being siphoned off by the cult. Certain cultists had to pay dues every so often, and the higher up in rank you were, the more often you had to pay. The money would be put into a communal box and was often used for mundane expenses and procuring. More supplies for our stockpiles. And sometimes we'd all get small cash bonuses on certain specific days like Samine and Beltane. He was one rank above me back in 1998. I had to pay once every three months, he paid once a month by the time I left the cult in 2002. I was paying once every two weeks and he had been transferred to the set over in Illinois for some secret ritual that they gave for. High-ranking members who were allowed leadership roles or could be given the right to start their own set. He got promoted around 2000. Shortly after the Y2K New Year celebrations, I never saw him again after he left Iowa. That being said, if the cult I was in was trying to infiltrate the industry, Maybe they were being used as proxies for a bigger cult or organization with more real pull. The only place I could ever find this arcade was at actual carnivals or festivals. I dug it enough to where sometimes that would be the main reason I'd go to the carnival festival. Damn. That was weird. I've encountered it at mall arcades and movie theaters, bowling alleys in the wild in several places over the years, and I do know that it was a massive success in the arcades which made its conspicuous lack of a sequel or console port all the more jarring. I do know that the console version wasn't meant to be a direct port, but a sequel, remake hybrid. Think Evil Dead 2 that was done by a smaller third-party company. And when you know who was involved in that unknown third-party crew, it becomes more obvious why there was no follow-up on the game's success. The decline of arcades in North America and the collapse of Midway in the late 2000s have only compounded the issue further. So how exactly does Greg fit into this? This game was released in 98 and in 00 video he was still a weeb. Did he become a huge cult leader so rapidly that he was involved in the attempted console port? Nah, Greg was part of the Canadian branch of the cult. The Carnaval port was handled by a set in Michigan he was rising through the ranks and last I heard. 
he was being primed to become a leader of the Ontario chapter. Greg fits into this mainly as proof of the cult's existence and the fact that they recruited from the outcasts of society and more or less did things they could to transform them. The girl had a weird obsession with JFK, maybe because of his Irish ancestry. Obviously, the circumstances of his death are incredibly suspicious. I wonder if he was deliberately bred to be the king, president of the USA. And his execution was a large-scale enactment of the sacrifice of the king ritual common to many. Indo-European mythologies, including Celtic. That's why his bloodline has such a political dynasty in Boston to this day. They're the modern equivalent of the Celtic pagan divine kingly lineage. I think you might be onto something. Also, if you're interested in learning more, I can give you the first name of my old roommate who was in the cult and worked on the released arcade version of Carnival at Midway. I can't remember his last name because it's been so long but I do know his first name is Rowan. Always found it eerie that a guy in a Celtic pagan death cult had the same name as a tree that figures into Celtic mythology and is also the name of the missing girl from the Wicker Man. When you say this cult was right-wing, what do you mean by that? Like what were some of their actual political beliefs? When you say this cult was right-wing, what do you mean by that? Like what were some of their actual political beliefs? Oh, this is the kind of shit I live for. What are the chances of recovering any material related to the tunnel scene? Any possibility of a script still existing out there? Maybe someone on the dev team could be contacted. I am absolutely enamored by your lead. Thank you for giving this to us. And, please, keep it coming. I don't know if there's a script still out there and I'm kind of worried about the dev team being contacted not everyone in the Midway dev team were cultists. I know for a fact Jack Hager wasn't. It was only Rowan and someone else whose name I can't remember not sure if it'd be a good idea to bother them about the cultist stuff. If they're still involved or the cult is still active, that could blow back on both me and him. Contacting them about early builds of the game or the script of the game might be acceptable, as would seeing if you could find the third-party devs who were trying to make the unfinished console reboot of the game with the license. Fight!